So um, good afternoon to those of you from Europe and obviously good morning to those of you from the United States and Canada. Um, thank you very much for joining us in the first of a series of webinars from Gilman. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Gilman Laboratories was founded about 40 years ago. In fact, at April 8th was our 40th anniversary. They're based out of Basel, just outside of Basel, Switzerland, which is now home to all the R&D and manufacturing. Buhlmann is a small to medium-sized company, family company, owned and over the last few years has developed into a unique leader in the diagnostics industry. My name is Colin Shaw. I represent Buhlmann Diagnostics Corp., the North American affiliate for Buhlmann Laboratories. Um, the reason we're here today is to talk about Flowcast and the, and the assay itself and the application. You may know that the Flowcast, uh, the Buhlmann cast assays were actually originally developed for cellular allergy and food hypersensitivity testing. While this application is still in use and evolving in many forms and in many countries, thanks to the innate signaling pathways involved from basophil receptor activation signaling leading to CD63 presentation and degranulation, the serendipitous use of the CAS assay application in kinase pathway target screening and pharmacodynamic testing is of keen appreciation to many of those in small molecule drug development programs. Hence, to elucidate more on this topic, please let me introduce you to Dr. Michaela Romano. Michaela re, uh, received his PhD from the University of Verona, Italy, then moved into a career in the academic and industry immunology research field, focusing on functional bioassay development and immune receptor activation. Michaela joined uh, Buhlmann in 2011 and has served as the product manager for the, the basophil activation test, the CAST assays. So without further ado, please let us move on to uh, the, the presentation by Dr. Michaela Romano. Okay, Michaela. Thank you, Colin. Colin, thank you for the introduction and thanks to all the attendees for this webinar. As Colin introduced you, today is uh, my challenge is to try to explain you how a functional assay uh, that we are uh, that we have developed as a tool uh, to make the diagnosis of allergy can be also a powerful tool to test the bioactivity and the efficacy of these uh, small molecules inhibitors that Colin has uh, described uh, that are actually in the pipeline of several pharmaceutical company uh, targeting diseases that have nothing to do with allergy but of course we are in the same field of the uh, immune cell system and uh, um, as it is well known when immune cell system regulation failed it can be a cause uh, of a disease state typically uh, what uh, an immune cell uh, a, the immune cells uh, can start to recognize uh, self uh, self antigen as a danger and this is the basis of the promotion of uh, autoimmune disease on the other side you can also observe an abnormal lymphocytes growth that if not stopped in, in some way it can be the cause and the promotion of leukemia and other hematological malignancies. Uh, what is uh, what all these uh, um, malignancies uh, uh, are constituted uh, is a, an aberrant uh, cell growth and proliferation uh, that is mainly uh, done by an hyperactivation of the immune cell signaling inside these cells. So targeting key kinases that uh, are mediating this signaling, uh, I'm talking about PI3 kinases or Bruton tyrosine kinases, has been demonstrated uh, as a, a valid target for small molecule inhibitors to develop drugs against this uh, disease. Uh, I want to focus here on uh, a typical drug development process uh, that uh, um, you can see um, once a target uh, has been identified and validated, what do you need to make progress in your uh, research is to have uh, assays that allow you to screen your library of compounds in order to identify uh, those compounds that have uh, more and more bioactivity and once identified 
the lead compounds needs to be further developed. Uh, in order to do this in the fields of this group on kerosene kinase, PI3 kinase or C kinase, you will have on the market now mm, a lot of kinase enzymatic assays. These enzymatic assays are very cheap and fast and easy of use and they have of course the potential to be uh, high throughput. Uh, but um, as enzymatic assays, they have an intrinsic limit that is the lack of predictability and they poorly correlated with in vivo results and does not provide any physiological condition. So an improvement of this uh, would be to have a cell-based functional assays, uh, for instance with a transfective cell lines where you have a parameter that is uh, regulated by one of these targets. Um, I'm trying to summarize here which should be the uh, schematic characteristic of a cell-based uh, biosensor for these kinases. Should be uh, cells where you have a very defined uh, cellular function that can be easily detectable and quantified and uh, this function should strongly depend on the activity of your target kinase, for instance PI3 kinase or VTK or SICK. Uh, then uh, in order uh, this kind of uh, biosensor of course is uh, target based should still have these high throughput capabilities but should have also an improved predictability and a correlation with in vivo results in order to speed up your project and screw compounds and save time and money in your uh, research project. But uh, you don't need to team cut uh, any system with transpected cell lines or something like that because uh, I want to show you that in our body all of us uh, um, have the perfect cells that can match all these characteristics and these cells are the basophils. The basophils are the less abundant immune cells into the bloodstream. They have this unique capability uh, in the immune cells, within the immune cells, that is the degranulation upon the activation mediated by, the, uh, uh, by an allergen. Uh, this kind of function I will show you in a uh, uh, in few, in few minutes, uh, we know how to detect this degranulation and we know how to standardize the readout for this, uh, for this function. I want just to focus here on the concept that you have a cell system uh, that, the, uh, that has a function that is uh, tightly regulated uh, via um, an immune receptor and the typical immune receptor expressed by basophil is the IgE receptor that uh, induce an activation inside the cells and this activation is modulated by several kinases uh, that are shared by immune cells and are the typical target for instance uh, in uh, uh, leukemia research when you have a B cell receptor uh, already activated. Indeed, uh, uh, through the uh, IgE receptor of the basophils, uh, you will have an item activation signaling pathway that involved the sick kinase protein. Basophils also express gluten tyrosine kinases and this gluten tyrosine kinases has been uh, shown as a, a very valid target uh, for B cell uh, leukemia, for instance. Then basophil express two isoform OPI3 kinase, the delta subunit and the gamma subunit. The delta subunit uh, is in the same pathway of SIC and BTK, so it is mediating the signaling through the IgE receptor to induce the degranulation while the gamma subunit is the typical um, uh, isoform that is mediating uh, the signaling of G protein, uh, G protein uh, couple receptor uh, and in this system of the basophil a, a typical receptor can be represented by the FMLP receptor that is a semi transmembrane domain here. So you have a nice system. I want to uh, I want to uh, present to you this nice system 
uh, offered by basophils and uh, that can be where you have inside a cells the same machinery or more or less the same machinery that you can have for instance into a leukemic cells. Um, if we want to make a, a comparison of the two system, in leukemic cells is your target cells. Into leukemic cells you will have an upregulated and hyperactivated pathway, the same pathway, uh, that led to the proliferation of the cells and led to the survival of the cells. In basophils, the same pathway inside the cells is just modulating uh, the activation of the IgE receptor and the readout is a degranulation. Uh, so you have, uh, we can consider basophils as uh, really as a surrogate marker of, um, of, the, of your real target in your research project. Indeed, if you want to test on the basophil activation, uh, the bioactivity of your inhibitors, uh, if you are uh, developing PI3 kinase delta or SIC or BTK inhibitors, uh, while in your real target you will see an inhibition of proliferation and survival, here in basophils you need to activate the basophils, uh, for instance via a cross-linking and activating antibody for this high affinity receptor of the IgE, and then you will see the inhibition of the degranulation. But basophils offer a unique opportunity uh, also to check other uh, potential uh, pathway and uh, also to check the specificity of what you have seen before. Indeed, you can also induce the activation and the degranulation of the basophil via a different receptor, for instance the FMLP receptor as I introduced before, and this is activating uh, the degranulation by the pi 3 kinase gamma subunit. And when you test the inhibitors, uh, your, your inhibitors of before, of course, this time you should not be able to inhibit the degranulation. This is active, uh, this is uh, giving to you a, a nice system in which you have a positive uh, impact of your inhibitor on the activation induced by the anti-IgE receptor and the specificity control where you want to activate the basophil degranulation by FMLP and you don't want to see any effect. Uh, for all uh, people that are interested in the PI3 kinase inhibitors, uh, uh, they know that one of the big issues in this field is to identify those inhibitors uh, that are selective for the target isoform of the PI3 kinase. Uh, we have uh, five isoforms in the human body of the PI3 kinase and basophils express only the PI3 kinase delta and the PI3 kinase gamma. So here uh, this system offers you the opportunity to check the bioactivity of uh, your molecule uh, for the PI3 kinase delta if you activate the basophil degranulation via the anti-IgE receptor and the PI3 kinase gamma if you activate the degranulation by the FMLP. So just to to summarize, uh, you have a nice system that is already present in your body. Um, the basophils are the less abundant cells in the full blood, but if you take just 50 microliters of your blood, you will have enough cells, enough basophils into these 50 microliters uh, to be statistically significant in checking the bioactivity of your drug. You have a very defined function that is the degranulation mediated by the activation with a specific receptor. This function is uh, strongly dependent on your targets of interest, piatricanis delta, VTK, SIC, and you have a readout uh, that since more than 20 years in Ullmann, uh, we have the experience of the standardization and I'm talking about the basophil activation and I'm introducing here just some, uh, some technical aspect of how we have developed uh, um, this, uh, this assay. Basically, Flowcast um, is an assay uh, that allows you to determine the basophil activation in the 
full blood sample via flow cytometer. Uh, in the time, we have uh, developed a, an assay that uh, can recognize the basophils via the use of the CCR3 marker, that is a marker that is expressed only on basophils and eosinophils, but in flow cytometry, as you can see here, you can easily separate the basophil population from the eosinophil population uh, with the use of the side scatter parameter. And you can see here that all the other full blood um, in white blood population are not expressing the CCR3. Here you have the lymphocytes, the monocytes, and all the other granulocytes. So what you can do, you can take in flow cytometry this population here and check or, and check here if they are expressing an activation marker. Um, uh, we are using several activation markers have been described into for basophils. We are using the CD63 as an activation marker. CD63 is an interesting uh, receptor that is expressed inside the granules of the basophils. So upon the activation and the degranulation of the basophils, this uh, this receptor uh, become exposed on the uh, on the cell surface of this basophil. So here, what you can see is an example of basophils that have not been stimulated, and you see that um, these cells are negative for the CD63 parameter. Uh, once you activate the basophil, for instance, uh, with this uh, with our control, that is the anti-FC epsilon receptor antibody, you can see here that you can have uh, a population of basophil that are expressing the CD63 antibody. And as you can see, you can have a, a double population and dichotomal population, cells that are not expressing CD63 or cells that are expressing CD63. This is typical for CD63, is a non-off status. You can see here that each basophil uh, can express or not the activation marker. That is reflecting more or less what is happening uh, as a functional aspect, not the granulated cells or the granulated cells. Uh, in the market, you can find uh, several other activation markers that have the typical behavior of such markers that are present on a cell population and increase the expression on the population. So it's not really this dichotomy population. But with our system, you will have a non a non of system. Of course, uh, this is the last part, the technical part of the assay, and I want to see, show you how simple is this uh, this assay because you uh, just need to collect the blood where your biosensor, where your basophils are present, and we will see in a moment. Uh, how you can, uh, uh, where you can find the applicability of, uh, of this system. And once you get this blood collected, uh, you just need to stimulate the cells with the anti-FC epsilon receptor, stay in the cells for flow cytometry, and then go to the instruments and check and quantify the percentage of cells that are expressing CD63. The kit is reflecting uh, the simplicity of this system, and indeed you can see just in a kit format uh, a stimulation buffer that is mandatory to stimulate uh, the cells. We have worked a lot in the standardization of this buffer in order to, uh, to have a very highly standardized activation of the basophils. And then the other component are the two stimulators. One is the anti-IgE uh, antibodies, and the other is the FMLP, and of course you will have uh, the reagent that allow you for the staining is the mixture of antibody against CCR3 for the selection and CD63 for the detection. Then you have additional two bottles that, um, that are the typical reagents for flow cytometer, a leasing reagent and a, a wash buffer that allow you to reconstitute the cells uh, in order to be acquired to a flow cytometer. Uh, we have, um, uh, we have developed in the time a protocol that is very, very uh, short and with uh, the low handling uh, possible. Uh, as you can see here, 
you will have only four pipetting step and this is in order to avoid any handling of the samples uh, uh, that can increase the variability between samples. You have only, in each stimulation tube, you have only to add your stimulus, the anti-FC epsilon receptor antibody or the FMLP, then the stimulation buffer, your blood that uh, contains the basophils, the staining reagents, wait, incubate for 50 minutes at 37 degrees and then proceed uh, with the lysis of the red blood cells, centrifugation and going to the flow cytometer analysis. This will take to you only 30 minutes. Uh, I want to show you which is a typical readout uh, uh, with some numbers, for instance. Uh, in the bottom part of this picture, you can see uh, a basal activation where you have no basophil stimulation. And as, um, and as I shown you before, you will have cells that are expressing CCR3 and are negative for the CD63. Uh, once you uh, had the anti-FC epsilon receptor, you induce the basophil degranulation and you see here a population of cells that express the CD63. And so you can quantify uh, these cells as percentage of cells that are expressing the marker. Then if you add increasing concentration of your, of your inhibitor, for instance a BTK inhibitor or a piatricanis delta inhibitor, what you can see is a partial or a total inactivation of this function, this degranulation. I want to focus here, uh, your attention here, oops, I apologize, uh, the attention here uh, that uh, you have really a percentage of cells that are still degranulating and if, if you see the, um, the value of the uh, activation marker CD63 is exactly the same of the starting population. This is just because what is important, the parameter that is important is how many cells, how many basophils have degranulated. So in a partial inhibition you will have less uh, degranulated cells, in a total inhibition you will have no degranulated cells like a basal uh, no activation. Now, uh, of course, I've described you this biosystem, but how this biosystem, this uh, basophil degranulation, can be integrated and in your research project and can support your drug development process. Uh, you have a, a very easy system. The basophil is not degranulated, degranulated and you want to inhibit this degranulation and you have your system is uh, already present into the blood. So you can think about application in in vitro application where you can uh, screen uh, your compounds um, and you can think at developing some protocol where you pretreat uh, your donors of basophils, you can take several donors of basophils and uh, screen uh, a lot of testing tubes uh, your library to check the, uh, for the compounds that have the best performance into inhibiting the basophil activation. And this is uh, an application now that with the advances into the flow cytometry instruments can be really high throughput because uh, years before flow cytometry all of you only a single test tube testing uh, or at least on a carousel that can uh, uh, where you can test um, about 30, um, uh, 30 tests per run. Uh, then a second generation uh, of high throughput system all of you the testing in the 96 well played format but really in the last couple of years or something more you will have a new generation, you have a new generation of instruments uh, that allow you to work in a 384 well plates um, allowing you the analysis of uh, um, a full plate in less than 10 minutes. This is, uh, this is uh, now we can really talk about high throughput flow cytometry with the specific uh, uh, with the specific instruments. Uh, of course, you will have uh, when I've introduced the system, I've 
Uh, I've told you that uh, one of the main uh, characteristics of a potential biosensor should be the predictability of the in vivo results. And there is nothing better than bus office because here in the in vitro testing you are working in full blood and is the transfer of this information into the human body is uh, more or less immediate. Indeed, you can imagine that instead of using a test, a test tube to check the bioactivity of your drugs, you can, uh, you can implement the uh, basophil activation also in uh, in vivo study where especially in the first in vivo study uh, where you need pharmacodynamic biomarker uh, just to check the bioactivity of your drug, this basophil activation is perfect. Indeed you can imagine uh, to check at time zero the basophil activation uh, in your patient that is uh, under treatment uh, with your drug and upon the intake of, treat of the drug by your patient you can follow over time uh, which is the uh, bioactivity uh, of the drug into the body of the patient simply taking time by time uh, the blood from the patient and checking for the uh, percentage of CD63 cells. Here is just an example of a patient that is uh, tested with an active compound, an inhibitor, and this is what should look like a, a placebo-controlled group. And uh, this is another extremely important uh, application really as a pharmacodynamic biomarker when you uh, can couple the results of the bioactivity obtained with the percentage of inhibition of CD63 activation and you can integrate these results with the, with the pharmacokinetic data where you determine the amount of uh, the drug that is still available in the, uh, in the blood of the patient and you can easily check uh, which are the right concentration inside the blood of a patient that give you the highest bioactivity of your target. Of course, this is a, an effect on a surrogate uh, target. It is not your real target that maybe here can be a, a leukemic patient, a CLL patient, uh, but this is an effect, uh, is still an effect on a cellular target into the body. Here I'm just summarizing uh, a proposal for a protocol um, where you where you have a testing tube that can be a testing tube uh, coming from an in vitro experiment or a testing tube coming from a patient that has uh, taken the drug and what you just need is to uh, to compare the uh, CD63 activation of the basophils when you activate the cells by your stimulator, your uh, anti-IgE uh, pathway stimulator or your unrelated pathway stimulator that is the FMLP and of course on non-activated basophils as control. Uh, I want just to conclude my, my talk of today showing you that this is not only an idea that we have uh, but uh, I want just to uh, show you some real cases uh, where the basophil activation and the flow cast has been successfully used uh, into this field. Uh, into, mm, this, is, um, this is a study that has been performed in Gilead where they have successfully implemented flow cast on a 384 well plate format to have a really high throughput screening of their library of compounds. A, here you can see what are the results of this implementation. You can uh, uh, move from 15 compounds that can be screened per week to 200 compounds that can be screened per week. And you can reduce also the FTEs uh, on your project and you can support, in that case, uh, they are uh, can support much uh, more than uh, just a couple of projects. Uh, this is just an example of the adaptation on a on an high throughput screening 
and I want just to give you another example um, that has been from now, uh, um, another example in the field of the selectivity uh, of the this inhibitor between the pietric kinase delta versus gamma. And this is a Cal101 inhibitor that uh, now is in the market as a delalizib or zidelic that has been approved by the FDA for the, the CLL treatment. In the first study, they have used Flocast just to check the selective activation of uh, and inhibition of the PI trichinase delta signaling versus the PI trichinase gamma signaling. Indeed, if you see the percentage of activated cells uh, when you increase the concentration of the drugs, you can see that at lower concentration you can uh, inhibit the activation induced by the anti-IgE receptor, anti-IgE receptor that is controlled by the delta subunit while you need more and more, more and more quantity of the inhibitor to see an effect of the uh, FMLP activation uh, that is uh, mediated uh, and regulated by the gamma subunit. Then uh, we have just summarized here a, a list of compounds uh, that have seen, uh, that have taken benefit from the basophil activation uh, in the, in, in the a research project just to check the, the bioactivity and the pharmacodynamic activity of these inhibitors. And this is just a list uh, of inhibitors. Some of these uh, uh, have used uh, or reduced flowcast. And in case you have any, you want any more information, we can discuss, uh, of course, on this. Okay. I'm. I've concluded my my talk at this stage. Thank you very much, uh, Michaela, um, for the background and the insight and, uh, and the various examples of how uh, Flowcast can work for various drug discovery programs. If anybody has any questions, uh, this is a good time now in the right panel to uh, pose them to us. Uh, to go over this last slide, uh, please let me know that. Please let me tell you that. Uh, we know this assay offers um, easy, fast, and reliable solution for analyzing basophil activation testing via flow cytometry. With the inclusion of the two stimulants um, for analyzing basophil activation, uh, we can provide insight into drug potency and therapeutic efficacy for compounds in development. Uh, we can offer you test format and work uh, solutions for you to design an application to suit your needs. Uh, this test require, uh, that Michaela describes requires only 50 microliters of blood to utilize the robust, sensitive, uh, specific, and reproducible tool for screening and pharmacodynamic testing. Um, the offer, this test offers results in 30 min minutes, and as uh, Michaela identified in the last couple slides, uh, it is scalable from a, a single test to 96 well plate formats to 80, 384 well plate formats. So, it's highly adaptable to your uh, needs. Uh, please know that we do offer extensive laboratory and assay protocol development experience from uh, ourselves here in the in, in the United States and Canada, Buhlman Diagnostics Corp, as well as um, uh, we call upon the expertise of our partners back in uh, Basel, Switzerland, in manufacturing and R and D uh, for Michaela and other colleagues there to help us um, and develop evaluation and validations for customer specific protocols. Uh, we can work with you on the implementation of this assay for ex vivo and in vitro testing workflows. Please know that this assay is a research use only assay um, as we've indicated and marketed throughout. This is not for IBD use in, in the Canada or the United States. And if anybody has any specific questions long term or moving forward about how to implement this assay or uh, about evaluating this assay, please let Michaela Romano know or myself, Colin Shaw know. Uh, you can see our email address is here at the bottom, or you can feel free to call us. Um, look it up the numbers on BuhlmannLabs.com is our website. So uh, thank you, Michaela. It looks like we have a couple questions coming in. Okay. Um, the first test is do you, the first question is do you need to inhibit all three kinase pathways? Um, this, 
SYKBTK and PI3 delta to inhibit the Ig receptor mediated activation of CD63. Uh, does that make sense, uh, mm -hmm. Kayla? Yeah, uh, no, uh, these kinases has, are not redundant kinases. These are one after the other in the signaling pathway. So if you inhibit one independently to the other, uh, you will obtain uh, the uh, inhibition of the basophil degeneration. You do not need to inhibit all the three. If you are focusing on BTK project uh, or in, on a PI3 kinase project or a SICK, uh, you uh, you can proceed only with uh, with these kinases. Okay. Um, thank you. That helps. The next question: uh, What are the requirements for blood? Sorry, this is a small dialog box. box for blood samples requirement, is it uh, whole blood or EDTA uh, plasma required? And how fresh does the blood have to be? Okay. Uh, mm. We are working mainly with EDTA blood, uh, taking the blood um, because this is the best way in which the the basophil activation can be uh, can be maintained over time. Uh, of course, in the into the development of the assay, we also tested other blood like heparin blood or citrate blood and. Uh, uh, we can also provide uh, insight into um, protocols for this kind of blood. But the ADTA is the best blood and basophil can maintain their activation status for up to 48 hours into this kind of blood. Uh, so when you have, when you take the blood from the patient, uh, you have um, at least 24 hours to 48 hours time uh, to perform your basophil activation assay. So this is your time window that is fitting with uh, several, uh, for instance, several CRO demands that are collecting blood sample from uh, clinical sample and then centralizing the testing in their uh, central lab. Thank you for that response. Um, and that hopefully that provides the insight you need to know for uh, for producing your samples. Uh, any clarification, please let us know. We can uh, we can provide that information to you. Uh, the other question is um, how how does Flowcast compare to other tests? And then they say Baso test, Baso test. Sorry, how does yeah. how does the Flowcast compare to other tests, including Baso test? Is the question. Uh, we have never done um, direct comparison with other tests because uh, as far as we know we are um, uh, all uh, the customer that are using our assays uh, find all the necessary uh, um, component of the system uh, because what we have compared to other tests we have the best uh, selection meter that is based on this CCR3 marker uh, because other assays are using different activate this different selection method of the basophis like IgP receptor that is for instance dependent on the uh, um, IgE level that each patient or each donor has. So you will have a, a, a receptor in the selection of the receptor uh, that is not stable. Uh, over um, over different patients. For instance, if you were talking about baso test, then other um, tests in the market can use different marker than the CD63, uh, and we really rely on the CD63 as uh, as the best marker to be select uh, to be used as a, an activation marker. Thank you, Michaela. The, um Another question here is, what is the difference of the stimulation buffer versus the anti-FC, Epsilon R, or the FMLP stimulation buffer? Um, if I understand correctly, in our stimulation buffer, uh, you will have all the, um, the buffer to properly stimulate the basophils. It is a buffer where we have optimized 
the, the salt concentration, we have optimized the calcium concentration because we are working with EDTA blood and we know that EDTA is an inhibitor of the signaling, so we have um, uh, balanced this effect of EDTA uh, adding calcium to our buffer and uh, uh, the other important um, uh, component of our, uh, of our uh, stimulation buffer is the interleukin-3. Interleukin-3 is a pre-activator of the basophis. This is meaning that it is not activating the basophis per se, but it increases the response of an, another activator. Then uh, we have a, a very special activator of the IgE receptor, because IgE receptor uh, mm, is uh, composed by uh, several isoforms on the receptor and we have an antibody, monoclonal antibody that is cross-linking the eye affinity receptor on the cell surface. You can find on the marker other IgE antibodies and that are using, um, that are simply using the uh, constant portion of the IgE that are present on the cell surface of the basophis and they are cross-linking this. Uh, so it is uh, not the same uh, to cross-link the receptor. Uh, this, uh, we know, we have the experience that if you use uh, an anti-IgE um, antibody, you can have a variability between uh, donors and donors because uh, each donors can differ for the amount of IgE that are decorating the basophils and uh, this depends on the IgE level that you can have in the sera of, uh, of your donors. Then the FMLP is a totally independent activator of the, um, of the basophils and as I shown it has a, a specific receptor that is activating in a different, uh, we, we, we tell as non-immune pathway the the basophil. So it's really a negative uh, um, control for, the, uh, for all these inhibitors that are activating the immune receptor of the basophils. I hope to have clarified this question. Thank you, Michaela, uh, for that response. If uh, the person has any further uh, clarifications they want on, that, on the differences in the buffers, please do let us know. Uh, please let me know at any time. My email address is cms at buhlmanlabs.com. My name is Colin Shaw, or, uh, and I can reach back out to you, or I will introduce you to Michaela Romano. If there's uh, no other questions uh, at this time point, I would like to say thank you to our attendees for joining today, and uh, I like, would like to give a big thanks to uh, Michaela Romano and all our friends back in uh, Buhlman in Switzerland for all their work in putting this, uh, this, uh, this, this product together and for presenting uh, the information today. And then uh, also would like to thank our, our marketing person here uh, at Buhlman in, in, in the United States, uh, Stacy Smith, for coordinating this whole event. And if there are no further questions, then we'll uh, sign off for the afternoon and say thank you very much and take care and have a good day. Bye. Bye.